เดียไทยเดียเดียเดียไทยเดียสังฆะฮัลโหลอ่ะ there we go can you hear me without the microphone maybe Let me try without the microphone, and then, if you're having trouble hearing, please come closer. There's lots of space up here, <laughs> because we we couldn't use the headset today because tomorrow we have the Dhamma talk down in the Oak Grove. So, dear friends, today we're learning the twenty-fourth tenet, which is about rebirth, and I want to try to uh, really. Stay close to Thai's way of presenting this <laughs> a little bit more than in other classes, so uh, we can understand. It's not complicated, but it's important. So 24, we can only understand <coughs> the real teaching of rebirth In the light of impermanence, non self and interbeing. So, already we've talked about uh, two kinds of truth in Buddhism. So we talk about the historical or the relative truth, sometimes the historical dimension. And in that relative truth, um, there's b r o t h e r f o r Blue, Ko t u i Do, Jonathan. <laughs> There's the father, and the father is the father, and the son is the son. And uh, there's up and down, and left and right, dual, dualistic ways of thinking. And in the ultimate truth, we see that the son is in the father, and the father is in the son. <laughs> that without uh, below, you cannot have above. That without the left, you cannot have the right. So they they are not uh, left and right are not separate, but actually they are two ways of looking at the same reality. And so this teaching on the two truths is a way of helping us to to not get caught in uh, worldly notions, uh, concepts, thoughts, but to be able to unify our body and mind and go beyond. Uh, Uh, conditioned phenomena, so that is the purpose of the teaching of the two truths, <laughs> to touch the unconditioned. So that's the theme throughout all of these talks: <laughs> how to touch the unconditioned, so to recognize how we grasp at uh, uh, "I am the son of my father; I have nothing to do with my father." This kind of thinking, and instead go deeper and see that actually, the, my father is in every cell of my body. Just like the son is a continuation of the the father, and so the son is in the father, 
Father is in the Son, they are not separate. They are just two manifestations, two different ways of looking at the same reality. So, so relative truth and absolute truth. Or conventional truth and uh, the absolute truth. Or And because we are, for fun in these classes, we're going a bit deeper, so we're learning the Sanskrit. <laughs> so this is Samriti Satya. This is Paramatta Satya. right the first time, Paramartha, 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 Paramartha Satya. Paramartha means the, the meaning, Artha, which is Parama, the goes beyond. So, uh, and samriti is just a, a, a turning of things uh, conventionally. And so in, every, uh, in everything we, we look to see, is this relative truth? Is it absolute truth? <laughs> is it just the surface of things? Or can we look more deeply, practicing the concentration on aimlessness, signlessness, emptiness, so we can touch the absolute truth, which goes beyond just concepts and notions. So we can think of rebirth, sometimes we call it samsara, right, the wheel the turning wheel of birth and death. <laughs> we can think of it in terms of relative truth, but if we want to go deeply, we need to look at it in terms of absolute truth. So most uh, in, uh, in popular Buddhism, most people talk about rebirth in terms of relative truth. So we say, oh, okay, so I have this consciousness, and when my body dies, then that consciousness separates itself from my body and it floats around in space looking for another embryo to go into. It's like in the bardo or something, right? And then it looks for another, uh, I think they call it a gandaba or gandharva to, to go into to then re-manifest as a new person. And so that is just the popular sense of rebirth. And so, Everywhere we go, when we, we are a monk, if you say you're a Buddhist, they say, oh, do you believe in reincarnation, right? <laughs> that's how many times people ask that question. And this is a relative truth. It's a kind of relative understanding of Buddhism. But if we, we are really sincere in our practice, we have to go deeper. <laughs> so we cannot just stay at the level of popular Buddhism, but we need to go, go deeper. Because we know, as we learned already, that uh, there is no... A separate self. So right away when we start to talk about this kind of consciousness that separates itself from the body and floats around in space and finds another <laughs> place to inhabit, it's, it's already caught in the idea of a, some kind of self that is like uh, separate from the body. And so we, we learned already about these different ideas of Self that's in the body, self that's separate from the body, <laughs> self that's both in the body and separate from the body as wrong views 
different ways of getting caught in the idea of the self. So here we want to touch, practice a deep Buddhism. We go deeper to touch the absolute truth. So mostly we tend to have this dualistic idea about the body and the mind. body is this fleshy thing that you can touch, this material thing, and the mind is something ephemeral that is very quick. It's not heavy like the body, it's light, fast, like electricity, <laughs> and uh, it can know things. It has the quality of knowing, whereas the body is just a lump of flesh. It, it, it's not p participating in this lightness or uh, kind of this act of knowing. It's just there as a kind of, you could say, a support system for the mind. <laughs> or the mind is, uh, is, 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 uh, support, is supported by this uh, lump of flesh, the body, right? And this kind of dualistic thinking has permeated our culture, not only Western culture, but also in many cultures in the world. And so it's very, it's very clear to see why if we talk about the relative understanding of rebirth, why if we have this preconceived, notion, preconceived notions about the body and the mind, how easy it is. It just makes sense, right? Mind is one thing, it's separate from the body. And when the body dies and the mind continues on somewhere else to find another body to inhabit. And Easy, right? <laughs> well, it's a bit more difficult when you look deeply. So, Tai talks about two points of view concerning body and mind, which are um, misunderstandings which we see today. So, one is a teaching that is very often seen in neuroscience, which is that the mind is, um, is an is a attribute or um, uh, emergent property of the body or the brain, specifically. So we can say the brain is a part of the body and it gives rise to consciousness. say the brain, the body, gives rise to consciousness. So if we have a problem in the, in the mind, then we just need to treat the brain. So this is a, a kind of medication philosophy. Right? So if we can just fix the chemistry of the brain, then we fix the problems in the mind. <laughs> so if you are sad, we find something to change the chemistry of your brain so that the sadness no longer manifests. If you are very easily excited or angry, then we, all we need to do is change the chemistry in the brain and then your sadness and anger will no longer manifest in consciousness. So that is one point of view that's very common in neuroscience today. And the second point of view is this one I already mentioned. But the brain is matter, which is one thing, and consciousness is spirit, which is another thing.
consciousness is spirit, which is another thing. And this is the point of view that is common in popular Buddhism and also other spiritual traditions that this uh, fleshy body, the physical brain, that's not important. What is important is consciousness, which is spirit. And that is another thing. So, one is a very prevalent view in science and the other is a very prevalent view in spirituality, you could say. And both of them are based on a dualistic understanding of body and mind. So both of them separate matter, the body, from non-matter, the mind, consciousness, the, the thing that can know or experience. So we're going to see, can we go beyond these <laughs> dualistic ways of looking at the body and mind? Maybe we can listen to a bell. So we're using the teaching on impermanence, to being to go beyond the, notion, the dualistic notion of body and mind. So we can bring back together the body and the mind. So we learned in the last class that the uh, the five aggregates are like an ever-changing stream. So the body, the feelings, perceptions, mental formation, consciousness, they're, they're, um, they're not uh, permanent, but they have some continuity. There's a, a sense of continuing. So this body, you look at me, this body standing here, and I'm not just suddenly every instant changing to a new shape or form, right? <laughs> Just by random, but there's some kind of continuity. But at the same time, skin cells are, f dead skin cells are falling off of my body. Um, uh, maybe there's some sweat that's evaporating into the air. So it's not the, uh, what this body is, it appears to be somewhat permanent, somewhat stable, but actually it's ever changing. It's always interconnected with other streams of causes and conditions. And the same is true for our feelings, our perceptions, our mental formations, our consciousness. This is an ever-changing stream. So that's what we learned in the last class, in the 23rd tenet. And so we use that insight to look at the body and the mind. In Buddhist teachings, the Buddha taught about two kinds of views which are extremes, wrong views. So the first one is uh, annihilationism.
it means the view that, for example, when, when this body uh, dies, then that's it. There's nothing. So from something, a living, breathing person, you just become an inert piece of matter on the ground. Nothing. So when we think about our life, sometimes we might think, oh, okay, there's that moment that we're born. And then we turn 10 years old, 20, 30, 40. Well, I just turned 46, so I wanted to keep going up. <laughs> but generally, you know, you have this idea that and things start to go down. What do you think, Tuido? Is that right? Or does it keep going up? <laughs> we'll find out later. And, uh, and then there's this point where you die. And so this, everything above this line is being. <laughs> and then everything below this line is non-being. And so, before you were born, you, you were nothing, and then from nothing you became something. And then you continue to grow and manifest and live your life, and then suddenly there's this point where you cross the line again from being into non-being. So when our loved one dies, we think, where have they gone? In just one day they are there, and then suddenly they're not there anymore. And we think they've passed from being into non-being. And so as you might have <laughs> figured out by now, that's also a dualistic way of looking at, at, the, at the world. To think that things uh, from nothing, something becomes something. When we look deeply, actually, that at every moment there are clusters of causes and conditions which are manifesting, which are being input into this body, these feelings, these perceptions, these mental formations, and so forth. That the, whether it's the light that's coming in through the eyes in this hall uh, that I can see in the periphery, an orchid on the table, the sound of my voice, which is also coming in through my ears and others, whether it's the temperature of the air, whether it's the food that we ate for dinner or lunch, whether it's the gate walk that we just went on, you know, that our body is feeling rested. Those are all inputs which are constantly coming in. And at the same time, we're also outputting, just by our way of sitting here, our way of breathing, we are communicating something, being present for this class. That's a kind of output. When we're calm and steady, just by our way of walking, sitting, we are actually offering something. So every moment is a moment of receiving and giving. So every moment is this input and output. And so, it's not like that, that receiving and giving just starts at one point and then ends here. <laughs> but we know, that, of course, that before this being born, then you are someone's in your mother's womb, and before that, you are an egg in your mother's ovaries. And yeah, but you are not only that, you're also your mother. You're also the conditions in which she lived, the food that she ate, the sun, the rain, the water, <laughs> like the, all these things. And you're not strictly that, that, that fetus in your mother's womb because you're always changing, right? We're an ever-changing stream. So that is a condition that brings you to the moment that you are experiencing right now, sitting here. But that's not a, a, a separate permanent self. That fetus is not strictly you but it is just one of the conditions, of, a many, of clusters of conditions, which give rise to what you are experiencing in the present moment, which includes society, teachers, uh, the way your parents raised you, experiences you had. Those are all coming together in the present moment to, to make this experience possible. And, uh, with that insight of non-self, you can continue into the future. So you're also outputting, uh, if we are a good practitioner, those positive elements that we've received. 
from our parents, from our teachers, and we try to reduce the negative output, <laughs> the part that makes other people suffer. And so th this is important because this is a deeper understanding of rebirth, the practice of touching rebirth in the present moment, not, not just this popular idea that you, know, you be reborn somewhere else <laughs> when, you, when you die. So once you, you're able to, to see these clusters of, these, uh, cluster of causes and conditions, then you see that actually there is, this is only a concept a line that we create between being and non-being. That actually, it's uh, nothing can never become something can never become nothing. <laughs> There's only continuation. Santati in in Pali, santati. It means a continuation continuing. So the cloud, the rain is a continuation of the cloud. The cloud continues into the rain. Our body continues into the earth, but at every moment it is also continuing on through our actions of thinking, our actions of speech, our actions of body. So this view of annihilationism is uh, a wrong view. And if we're not careful, we, whatever the conditions are in the present moment, we, we, we tend to fall into this view. So if we look into the situation of the climate crisis and the destruction of biodiversity, it can be very easy to fall into this kind of view that uh, the, the temperature is rising, that everything is, that we love and hold dear will become nothing. And so we miss what's actually going on. <laughs> the problem with this kind of view is that you, you, you just have a fear of this non-being and you try to avoid it at all costs. You say you want to hold on to being grasp onto this being and av avoid the non-being. <laughs> and so in doing that, uh, we don't help anybody. We don't help ourselves. We don't help our loved ones at all because we're actually not looking at what is actually going on, <laughs> which is actually clusters of causes and conditions. So it's not the extreme of just uh, nihilism or annihilationism, that this, this something, this wonderful, wondrous present moment is just going to disappear into nothingness. And the other wrong view is, or extreme, is the view of eternalism. How things are now, is how they have been as far as we know forever in the past and how they were now will be that way forever in the past. And so, for example, I have this self and it has been since beginning this time and it will continue into the future forever and in an unchanging way. <laughs> that is a, a wrong view of eternalism. And so some of us might think of a soul and we identify ourselves with that soul and that soul cannot be touched by the material conditions of the world. It is somehow uh, uh, transcendent, transcending uh, our, uh, is, it is not touched by our thinking, our speech, our bodily actions, or those uh, thoughts, speech, and actions of others. It is eternal. So these are two wrong views. One is getting caught in the idea of being. 
and the other is getting caught in the view of non-being. And so Buddha proposed a middle way, which avoids these two extremes of being and non-being. And Tai uh, used the phrase interbeing. It means we cannot be by ourselves alone. We can only interbe with all these marvelous uh, streams of interconnected causes and conditions, which are continuously being input and output in every moment in our living experience of life and awareness. So we don't need to um, fear that from being we will get thrust into non-being <laughs> and become nothing. And we also are not caught in the idea that things will last forever, unchanging and permanent. That is uh, the, the beauty of the insight of interbeing, or the middle way. So we can be scientists in our life of practice. We tend to um, kind of seed our, um, in modern times, our, our inner scientist to somebody who has a degree, who works in a lab, who has uh, very precise instruments. And that is a pity because science is something that is for everyone, something that we can experience, first person experience in, in our uh, daily life. When we practice sitting meditation in the morning, we can see, the, we can experience the calm that comes from just being aware of our breathing. And we notice the agitation that arises when we start thinking about what we're going to have for breakfast, <laughs> or we think about a difficult relationship, and what we're going to say to that person when we see them next. Our heartbeat starts to increase. <laughs> we feel a little bit restless, and we get pulled out of the present moment. And that you can observe, that is being a, a scientist as a practitioner. So we don't base our practice on just what the monk says or what Thai says or what the Buddha says, but we, we take that and then we put it into practice and we observe whether, how it works. If it makes us uh, more peaceful, more happy, we continue to do that practice. <laughs> but if it makes us suffer, <laughs> And we just, you know, we say, okay, I just push through the suffering. That is a wrong practice. We're caught in a view. Like we so want to be a Buddhist, we so want to be a mindfulness practitioner, we just want to bust through all of our suffering and somehow come out of the other side and enlighten Buddha. And that is completely missing the point. <laughs> because the path is happiness in every step. It is not for the, uh, that we sacrifice the present moment in order to attain some happiness in the future. So don't uh, forget that we are scientists, that we, are, we, we can learn from our experience. That is the living Dharma. We just read in books or learn from teachers in order to uh, remind ourselves to come back to the present moment. But the real teaching comes from our own experience of our body, our feelings, our perceptions, letting go of grasping and experiencing and learning from that experience and growing. That's the living Dhamma. And we see and, and we touch into being, which is really just this cluster of causes and conditions. So this orchid is, when we look deeply, a cluster of causes and conditions and interconnected streams of causes and conditions have come together to make this, this orchid possible. There's the rain, the sun, the earth, the nutrients in the, the soil. The, 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 the ancestors of the orchid that 
have given rise to this one. People have cultivated them to have a beautiful color. <laughs> so that person is also present in there. There's one of the causes and conditions in the cluster. There's the air. There are many conditions that are all streaming around and changing in real time. It's, a, it's incredible to see that. But then when we see with those eyes, we cannot just see just some flower, an orchid anymore. We start to have that penetrating view of everything, <laughs> including our own feelings and emotions. And so we see that when we have a, a moment of despair, a moment of anger, that is not only our anger. It's also the anger of our father, our mother, our ancestors. It's also the anger of our society, our culture. And so transforming that anger, transforming that despair is the act of a hero. It is not only just because of me that that anger is there, but it is because of my society. It is because of my parents. And so I'm transforming it for them. I'm doing the act of many, many, uh, many people. And I also know that it's not just me alone who is transforming that, that anger but it is a stream of my ancestors who are coming there for, uh, for, in order to support me <laughs> to generate a, a feeling, a, a mental formation of mindfulness to embrace that emotion. And that's very powerful when you can tap into your ancestral streams <laughs> that are present. And not just our ancestors, but also our teachers, our friends on the path. You can borrow their mindfulness. <laughs> so you don't just as an individual shine the light of mindfulness on that emotion, but you borrow the mindfulness. And because it's not actually the property of anyone. <laughs> the wonderful thing about mindfulness is that when you, you use, you, you, you borrow the energy of mindfulness from the Sangha, it doesn't leave the Sangha with less mindfulness. <laughs> when you... Uh, uh, when somebody has a, a, a nice uh, drink and you take that drink and you drink it, they don't have a drink anymore <laughs> and they're not happy. But the, when you borrow mindfulness, then actually, usually you generate, you help to generate more mindfulness in the Sangha because you use the mindfulness energy of the community, then you're able to like give it back to the Sangha in your way of thinking, in your way of speaking, in your way of acting. So it's a win-win situation. <laughs> That's why mindfulness is so helpful. <laughs> so we learn to observe our own experience. So look, we need to look and to see how, in what way even in just a moment, we fall into this view of annihilationism. Because it can happen in a second. We are smiling, we're joyful, and then suddenly, oh, there's nothing. I will be, I'm, not, I'm not anything. I'm totally nothing. And you feel like you've you're just fallen off the edge of a precipice. You're falling into space. Blackness, there's nothing. And it can happen just in an instant. And you feel lost. So, Come back to your body, come back to your breathing. That's why the first noble truth, there is suffering, is so helpful. <laughs> so if you find yourself in that moment of falling off a precipice, maybe you can just pinch yourself a little bit. One of my t teachers, one Zen master I, I studied with before I met Tai, he used to say that. If you feel, actually he said it when you feel like you're totally enlightened, just pinch yourself really hard. <laughs> <laughs> So you come, you come out of your conceptual thinking and back to the feeling of pain. So it's not, please don't pinch yourself too hard. <laughs> I don't want to, people tell me they, they pinched off their flesh or something. Yeah. It's, just a, it's just a technique to, so, but we don't need to pinch ourselves. We can see that there's suffering going on in every moment. Yeah. There's something, maybe a little bit of indigestion or there's a, there's, the thought of a difficult relationship, there's, there's suffering that's there. And so when you feel lost in nothingness, suffering can help you. Mindfulness of suffering. Like, 
ah, okay, no, there's still suffering. I'm not nothing. <laughs> there's still suffering. And that suffering can help you to come back. And so you come back to your breathing, come back to your body, come back to your step, and then you reestablish yourself in the present moment. And you can see again all the wonderful conditions that are there supporting you in the present moment. And you're no longer lost in that view of annihilationism. And the same is true of eternalism. Sometimes uh, there's someone in the family and they, they so want the family to come together for the holidays. Tomorrow is Thanksgiving. And many people want their deepest wishes for the family to come together. But actually, when the family comes together, almost nobody is happy. <laughs> People are arguing with each other, judging each other, blaming each other. But somehow, in that, maybe it's the grandmother, the grandfather, they, they, they have this concept, this idea, that the family is, is, is uh, the most wonderful thing. And so everybody tries to come together just for the sake of grandma or grandpa. <laughs> grandpa. And they try to do their best, but they still suffer. <laughs> and so that's a little bit like getting caught in this idea of eternalism. We, we have a concept and we think that if we can only have that concept, then everything will be right. It is kind of uh, eternal. So the concept of a soul can be like that. We, we, we feel like we cannot accept that this body is has a nature to grow old. We feel like we cannot accept that this body has a nature to become ill. We cannot accept this body has a nature to die. And so we need something. We need something eternal to hold on to. If not, we feel cold inside. We feel like we're, we're, uh, we're lost. And so this is the the, the you know, the traditional antidote to annihilationism. Well, if you don't have a soul, then you must be. You're just some kind of nihilist, right? And we just bounce back and forth between these two, and we don't get anywhere. <laughs> we feel like in order to be happy, we need to think we have this permanent soul somewhere in there. And, but actually, I remember when I was a kid, my dad would, told this story, and I remember it very clearly. I was sitting in the back of the car. We were driving into town, and I just I, I, I said to my dad, I said, Dad, in heaven, do we, do we live there forever? And, like, can we never get out? <laughs> And I, th I thought, oh my gosh, this is like, what if I, I, like, you know, as a kid, when you have to go in your room and shut the door and you can't get out, it's like the worst, right? Well, sometimes it can be fun. But usually, you know, it's okay if you're staying in your room and you have the option to go out. But if you don't have the option to go out, you're just stuck there. <laughs> and somehow it's very unpleasant. Right? And so I, 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 I remember I was trying to understand this concept of heaven. I was not really raised religious, but I heard about it from someone, I don't know who. And I just heard that heaven is a place where everyone lives forever. You have eternal life. And I thought, wow, what if I, what if I don't like the people there? <laughs> like, I have to be with them forever? <laughs> I can't get out? <laughs> I'm stuck there. <laughs> and somehow I was eight years old, but I already had that insight that, like, like Thay says, vive l'impermanence, long live impermanence. <laughs> because it, thanks to impermanence, everything is possible. Thanks to impermanence, the young girl be, can become a beautiful woman, right? Thanks to impermanence, uh, the, the, in the spring, the grass can grow, the, or the, the flowers manifest. Thanks to impermanence, it's the nighttime, but 
Imagine if it just stayed night like all the time and the sun didn't rise tomorrow morning. So impermanence is, uh, is integral to the wonder of life that we experience in every moment. So long live impermanence. <laughs> right. So we, we don't want to get caught in this ping pong game back and forth between annihilationism and eternalism. And the way, of, way out of that predicament is to touch the inside of interbeing. We can listen to the sound of the bell. In the present moment, we are um, receiving input and we are giving outputs. So we are participating in interconnected streams of causes and conditions. And with the insight of, um, of non-self, we see that there's no conductor, there's no symphony, there's no director. So it's very interesting when we look into the brain and we see these neurons firing, can we find the neuron who is directing all the other neurons? No. <laughs> and yet the firing is going on. Somehow thinking is happening, the brain is functioning, the body is functioning. So it's like a symphony orchestra without a director, without a conductor. <laughs> And, uh, the, and intercon these processes of inputs and outputs are, um, are happening in a non-linear way. So we tend to think of time as just going like an arrow, right? From the past into the future. And here we are in the present moment. And we're just shooting along like on a, a train on a track towards the future. <laughs> But with the, so we have this uh, teaching on karma. And we know that sometimes uh, there are latent tendencies that are, are, have not yet manifested. We call seeds. Karma means action and bija. Are, are the seeds, which, we, yeah, in Buddhist psychology we talk about seeds. They're, but they're, it's a metaphor, right? So it's a, they're latent tendencies that are uh, planted, or you could say, sown by our actions. And primarily, uh, we talk about three kinds of action. There's the actions of mind actions of speech, and actions of body. And oftentimes, the actions of speech and body, they are manifesting in the mind. So that's why Buddhism <laughs> focuses so much on the, what's going on in our mind. So what comes out, the output, the input, comes in through our senses, our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. And the output is coming out through our mind as well, and our speech, and our body primarily. And so the field in which we can change the future is, 
in the field of our actions. We can change our thinking. We can change our speech. We can change our bodily actions. So when we look deeply with the eyes of uh, understanding the, the ultimate dimension, the absolute truth, Rebirth is happening in every moment through our actions. We are, um, as practitioners, we have received all these inputs in the past and we continue to receive them in the present moment. And we bathe those inputs in the light of mindfulness. We give them a mindfulness bath so that we can try to think, speak, and do those uh, uh, thoughts, speech, uh, thoughts, words, and actions that are beneficial and try to avoid the ones that cause harm to ourselves and to others. And that is our true continuation, santati. So it's like the cloud becoming the rain. <laughs> the... Uh, what is coming in, in this process of the present moment and in the past, the latent seeds that are there in our consciousness, our habitual ways of acting, they are all contributing to what is manifesting as thoughts, as speech, as action. And so this is, this is all kind of, that's why Tai talked about clusters of causes and conditions which are It's almost like a, a neuronal web of, and this is just two dimensions. We could have to look at three dimensions and actually four dimensions, the dimension of time and space as well. So, and in uh, one effect becomes an, the cause of another effect. And so, just like the father is in the son and the son is in the father, so also the effect is in the cause and the cause is in the effect. So rather than looking at just this kind of linear train track experience of time going forward along the rail, we can look at it from a, a more circular view, a more interconnected view, that there are clusters of causes and conditions which then produce other causes and conditions, and so forth. And those are all, uh, sometimes they, we call them latent, like seeds, because we cannot experience them directly through our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind. It is like, um, you know, deep at the collective level, when one group of people uh, mistreat, oppress another group of people. That is a kind of trauma which lives deeply, is, is, is in the body. But it might not be manifesting in the present moment, but then in certain moments of anger, it manifests. Like when a policeman kills a young black boy, then the, the anger that is there, the trauma, it manifests. And that is not only because of the death of that one boy, but it is, a, it is a, the latent tendencies that are in the collective consciousness of society. And so that is why healing is so important at the individual level and at the collective level. <laughs> if we don't heal, the trauma just continues. Those seizures continue, and they continue to manifest when causes and conditions are sufficient. So it's not enough just to have policies or laws. The, those can help. They're like a crutch. But for real healing to take place, we need to bathe uh, in the light of mindfulness, the collective consciousness of society. We need to be able to bring to light the, that trauma that is uh, hidden, latent, and allow it to, to heal, to manifest. So we need to recognize, just like we practice with our emotions, you know, stopping, recognizing the emotion, accepting and embracing, learning to embrace with mindfulness that difficult emotion, that pain, that trauma from slavery, from the slave trade, from uh, racial discrimination and so forth. 
This is just one example of many kinds of trauma that are in the collective consciousness. So Buddhist psychology is not just about one body mind construct alone. It is about it is it is a, a insight that that also comes with interbeing that we are not by, we cannot be by ourselves alone. That we are like um, when when uh, Sister Gina Sister Yunim in the abbot, former abbess of Lower Hamlet, she used the image of uh, candle amidst many candles. So the candle uh, produces light by itself, but it also contributes to the collective light of the many candles. And the collective light is far greater than the individual light. But there is no separation between the light of one candle and the other light, uh, the other lights of the other candle. So it's a, it's a nice way to, to look at the uh, you know, consciousness as an individual and consciousness as a collective. There's no uh, wall of separation <laughs> between our individual consciousness and the collective consciousness. We're just uh, like a candle contributing the light to the collective light of all the candles. And so when we produce an action, a, a thought, uh, a speech, uh, an action of our body that is actually going out in all directions. It's not linear, just going. We might intend that thought for just one person, but actually the effect is multivalent. <laughs> it's, it's going off in every direction and it can have effects far, and, and, they, and does always have effects far, far beyond what we imagine. And so even when we feel like we're being so precise and we're just trying to give that input or that thought uh, just to that one person, it affects many, many other people. And not only people, but also minerals, plants, animals, and all beings. So for example, we, we try to solve economic problems of scarcity by creating engines that can use latent energy like ancient sunlight, fossil fuels in the surface of the earth in order to transport food, in order to move people from one place to another. So we, 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 we produce a good that is intended for society, but we don't realize that there are other effects going on that our desire to more easily transport that food, more easily move people around from one place to another has effects on the plants, animals, the atmosphere. And even when it's uh, staring us right in the face, we still, because we are so caught in our desire to continue things as we know, we cannot see and we cannot change our way. And this is so dangerous. This is caught in a view of eternalism. That society is just based on extraction, continued extraction. <laughs> and then we bring, we create wealth for the common society and we benefit from that wealth. And so how dare you say, how dare you criticize the companies and the people who are extracting fossil fuels from the earth. But with the insight of interbeing, we can see that all of our actions have many, many effects in many directions, far beyond just our intended uh, effects. So this insight is essential if we are to do something to change. <laughs> if we are climate activists, we need to have the insight of interbeing in order to really affect the change. Otherwise, we just get caught in uh, <laughs> yelling at each other, creating two sides the evil fossil fuel companies and the good climate activists. We don't understand that the good intention of the other, we just close ourselves off. But when we touch into being, then we are able to, to touch our common humanity. We help others to see, to wake up to this nonlinear way of looking at causes and effects. 
seeing that they are going in every direction. And that is for not only for our, our happiness, but it's also for their happiness and their well-being that we help them to wake up, that we help them to understand, that help them to change their ways. That is the act of a bodhisattva. <laughs> and we can do it with loving words, but we are firm <laughs> in our path to reduce suffering for ourselves and for future generations. We have the vision of all of these effects and we want to, we want to find ways to reduce harm, to try to reduce the harmful effects so we can have a beautiful rebirth. <laughs> so the practice, this deep, the practice in deep Buddhism of rebirth is how to generate um, wholesome thoughts, wholesome speech, wholesome action, beneficial, whatever word you want to use, <laughs> words that is causes less harm, actions that cause less harm. That is what we are doing. And we know that to do that, we don't need to have a, a separate self. <laughs> we don't need to have a conductor. That's the interesting thing. It's like uh, last class I talked about the rain. Do we, we don't need a rainer for it to rain, and yet the rain happens. So we don't need a person to do a good deed. The good deed happens. It is a, a process. Everything is uh, processes going on and we are just uh, finding ways to, to train ourselves to guide these processes so that they produce more well-being, more peace, more calm, more understanding, more compassion, less hatred, less anger, less violence. So you're like a gardener of your own mind. But there's actually no gardener. <laughs> So you, you use the metaphor, but then you also know that the gardener is also non-self. You see, so everywhere we want to be careful not to create some kind of ultimate uh, God or, or self that is directing it. Because, not because, um, because we know that that is grasping there when we do that. And that grasping will lead to suffering. And so just like the rain, we can practice to just, just let it rain. We don't need a rainer. <laughs> it's like the wind. Let it blow, we don't need a blower. There's no need for a blower, for the wind to blow. So there is no self, but there is rebirth. So through impermanence, we see the ever-changing nature of our body, speech, our body, feelings, perceptions, mental formation. And that is the insight of non-self. And interbeing, the insight of interbeing helps us to move beyond these two extreme views so that our actions of our thinking, our sp speech, our bodily actions can be beneficial, help others and help ourselves. And all that can happen without the need for a self. <laughs> that is the deep teaching on rebirth. just as there does not need to be a thinker in order for there to be a thought. So there does not need to be a person reborn for there to be rebirth. So to come back to this dualistic understanding of body and mind, I think that now we can remove this line In many ways, this body-mind construct is a manifestation of these two extreme views. 
with the view of annihilationism, annihilationism we see this body is this, this mass of flesh and that from nothing it becomes something and then from something it will go back to nothingness. And yet the mind is eternal and everlasting. And so it's getting, by getting caught in these views that we create the body-mind duality. So we want to bring back together and see that uh, Tai uses the example of uh, uh, quanta, for example, a quanta, quanta of light. We can say that a photon is a, a wave when we look at it through the uh, eyes of electromagnetic theory. But we can also say the photon has the qualities of particle when we look at it, it from the eyes of quantum mechanics. So how can one and the same thing both be a wave and a particle? <laughs> how is it possible? Because we can only think of a wave as a continuous stream of something, and yet a particle is a discrete object, right? So how can one and the same thing both be manifesting in these two seemingly mutually contradictory ways? So the invitation is to look at our body and mind in the same way. Body and mind are not separate. In looking at our thoughts, our feelings, our perceptions, our mental formations, our consciousness, we think that is the area of mind. But that is just another way of looking at what is the body. And when we look at the body, this massive flesh, standing, sitting, lying down, moving around, breathing. We can see that another way of looking at it is the experience of pleasant sensations, unpleasant sensations, uh, anger, fear, jealousy, thoughts, uh, eye consciousness, ear consciousness, and so forth, taste. That they're just different ways of looking at the same reality. In Sanskrit, the term for consciousness is vijnana. And V is like a, is like a line, it's cut. <laughs> so it's a, you could, in some sense you could call it vijnana. Jnana is, a, jnana is a knowing. And V is like a, a divider. <laughs> so it's a knowing that divides one thing from another. Later in Buddhist logic, uh, there's a teaching on um, exclusion, apoha. So it's a very um, important concept that had influences all over uh, India and Asia, Asian thinking. The Buddhist logician uh, Dignyaga proposes uh, exclusion. He says, we know something is a cow by everything because it is, uh, by everything that is not cow. <laughs> so for example, an orchid is not cow. Uh, Jonathan is not cow. Uh, the light is not cow. And by all the things that are not cow, we can then decide what is cow. What is a cow? That is the, it's very, it's not complicated. <laughs> so using word, language by its very nature has a sense of cutting off. So we define one thing by saying it is not all these other things. So in our very way of speaking, by just using cow, you have all manifested in you imagination, 
hopefully, if you've seen a cow before, or you've seen a picture of a cow, something like a cow. And even though that experience of cow might be quite different for all of us, and we might have pleasant feelings, unpleasant feelings, but somehow we can all say that that experience of cow, of cowness, is separate from all the experiences of non-cowness, <laughs> right? So this is a, a way of logic, of, of, of thinking, that was not for the sake of, um, of uh, and just being pedantic or something, but it's for the sake of understanding how consciousness is actually dividing up reality. So, it, which is inherent in the very word of Vijnana, kind of divided knowing. So, we talk about eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, and so forth. So, eye consciousness is the consciousness which arises based on an object or form coming in contact with the eye. So, three things are necessary. You have the eye, you have the object, or, uh, say, forms. And you have the contact between them. So all these three give rise to a moment of eye consciousness. And the same is true for our nose, tongue, body, and, and our mind as well. So our, with the mind, and we learned already body and mind are not separate. They are one. <laughs> they are just different ways of looking at the same reality. The mind comes in contact with thoughts. And then that is a moment of mind consciousness. So even in our way of describing the experience of awareness, we, we divide up things. And that is for the sake of um, noticing how we grasp at them, to, and how that makes us suffer. <laughs> so when we, we, we look at the world in this way, um, that is just, we know that we are just looking at the same five skandhas, right, from the perspective of mind. But when we look at the perspective of, oh, that person has blue eyes, they have white skin, they have, you know, they occupy this amount of space in, in the room, they're wearing this clothing that we're looking from the perspective of the body. But that is not a separate they are, uh, we cannot uh, actually fundamentally separate those two. They are just different ways of looking at the same reality. So this is what Thay proposes to us as a way of overcoming this uh, dilemma, both in neuroscience and in this spirituality, where we divide the body and the mind <coughs> from each other. We need to learn how to re bring the body and mind back together. Actually, when we, we, sep we have ideas about our mind being separate from our body, it's just at the level of our concepts and our thinking. We, we, we have an idea, our mind, we can think about Italy, maybe some of us have been to Italy, maybe you, you've been to Rome. You s immediately you have images of Ro Rome, if you've been there, or if you've seen movies, and you think about the places you walk there, maybe you got a gelato near the Pantheon, it was really so tasty, and <laughs> yeah. so you're reliving. And then, but actually, that is an experience that's going on in the present moment. Your mind is somewhere else, but actually it's right here. <laughs> because that experience you're reliving of having a gelato in the middle of Rome, near the Pantheon, is, is, uh, that is an experience going on in the present moment. And your mind is actually not elsewhere. It's right here. 
right now. <laughs> so the separation is only an illusion. It's created by our mind. And that's what the insight of interbeing helps us to see, that these are just interconnected clusters of streams that interar with each other. And they are flowing in a nonlinear way, always uh, continuously going on, <laughs> even uh, before we were born and after we die. And so we start to see that birth and death is happening in every moment through our actions of thinking, our actions of speech, actions of, of, of body. And so you don't have to worry about the, where will I be reborn? Because you're being reborn in every moment <laughs> through your words, through your, your speech, through your actions. And that is a, an invitation to come back to the present moment and uh, really cherish this moment, take care of what we say, what we do, so that we can really take care of each other and be good continuations of each other, <laughs> good interconnected streams to bring about more uh, harm and uh, bring about more benefit and less harm for ourselves and for others. So this is the how we can use impermanence, non-self, and interbeing to understand the real teaching of rebirth, the deep Buddhism. We're not satisfied with just the superficial understandings. Oh, thank you for your listening. I realize this class is a little bit long, and I, I have, maybe it's a bit more technical, but I want to present it clearly, as clearly as possible. So thank you for your patience. <laughs>